I will uh, let Claire talk because she's the professional. But no, uh... <laughs> <laughs> no, no. I was, I was saying, Ryan, if you change the strings yeah. and you start messing around. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Hurdy Gurdy Cafe, an hour of interviews, music, and camaraderie. I'm Ryan, and I'll be your host along this crazy adventure through the land of the wheel fiddle. So strap in, and let's see what's cranking in the Hurdy Gurdy community today. Welcome back, everyone, to season two of the Hurdy Gurdy Cafe podcast. We're here with a very special guest today, Claire Duguay. Hi, Claire. Hello. Hi. Hi, Ryan. Great to have you. And as always, uh, Sergio Gonzalez is joining us. Hello, Sergio. Hello, everybody. Yes. And today we're going to start the podcast off with one of the tracks um, that Claire recommended she wanted us to listen to. And this is by Matthias Leubner. And how do you pronounce that, uh, that track title, Claire? Oh, um, I'm not too sure. Uh, oh. For las <laughs> cintilantas. <laughs> That sounds better than I would do. So. Sounds very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So let's have a listen to uh, this track by Matthias Leubner, and uh, we'll be right back with Claire. Thank you. 
welcome back to season two of the Hurdy Gurdy Cafe podcast. We're here with Claire Duguay. And Claire, why did you choose that track? What is it? Uh, how does it speak to you? Oh, um, well, really, I could have chosen most most tracks from from Matthias. Um, I find his way of playing very emotive, very beautiful. Um, I don't know what to say more, really. Something about Matthias. He's, well. he's a master. Yeah. What, 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 is, what is the way to say? <laughs> he's a master. And also when you see him play, he's really, he's really one with instruments, isn't it? It's the old body, mind. And I find you feel that when you it just gives good people watching right. him play. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Excellent. It's fantastic. Fantastic. <laughs> well, you're a, you're a hurdy-gurdy luthier. So you build hurdy-gurdies, correct? Mm-hmm. Yes. And you're in the, the south of the United Kingdom at the moment. Yeah. 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 Just uh, so just out of curiosity, how did you how did you first come to the Hurdy Gurdy? How did you how did it come into your life? It was complete accident, really. It wasn't Ooh. planned at all. Uh, I was I was 21. I uh, didn't know the Hurdy Gurdy at all. And I was in London at the time to train as an instrument maker and training to make uh, early string instruments. Uh, guitars, early guitars, lutes, um, and a friend one night uh, suggested to me to come to an evening of uh, French trad music and dance in London. And I went, um, not knowing what to expect, and there was um, a spe- special guest for the night, and it was um, Turning the Red, with special guest. Turning the Red was Cliff Stapleton and Herdy Gurdy and Chris Ooh. Walsh. And special guest was Nigel Eaton. Oh, nice. Wow, okay. <laughs> good. Yeah, it, 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 it's a very good first contact with the Hardy Girl, yeah, right? <laughs> no idea how good they were. I thought they were good. Um, and that was that. I you know, was besotted. And the next day I came to college and told my tutors that was what I wanted to make. And um, and they gave me the freedom to start making Hardy Girl. So that's, so, that's how it, Oh, it, nice. You, you went to learn to build instruments and then you were introduced to the hurdy gurdy and French traditional music in London. In you're, from, London. <laughs> you're from France. I'm France. I'm French, yes, yes. Okay, so did you, was that, it never came into your awareness before then? When in Well, the- not really. I mean, I, I had some interest in, um, well, actually, bizarrely, I, I, my dream was to make flamenco guitars in Spain. And um, okay. that day, <laughs> I was really into flamenco and play those. Very nice. Um, and no, I had some interest in folk music, but in France, if you're out of the scene, in um, I was the southern part of Normandy, I knew quite well about Breton traditional music, but if you're outside of the scene, you, you don't really know it. It's not very present in national media. And mm. So no, I didn't really know uh, the right. scene. So when so, I discovered it, mm. I, the same friend took me to uh, Saint-Chartier, few months later and that was a big revelation and I just realized this is enormous scene there which you know um, that was wonderful for me. Mm. Were you uh, when where you were building instruments was there someone that could show you how to build hurdy gurdies I mean how did you figure it out? No. Yes, that's interesting yes yeah how'd that happen? Yeah no I mean I was what was then called the London College of Furniture so it was this in the middle of London these big workshops uh, there were um, uh, modern guitar workshop, piano, harpsichords. Um, I was still left in the early early string instrument workshop. There was no one there who, who could make handy goodies. Um, but there was a facility, and there was a full metal metal workshop with um, what do you call uh, technicians. So they taught me how to mm-hmm. use a metal lathe. So I learned by myself to turn my axles. And so it's using all the knowledge around and the facility. So you learned it just by figuring it out yourself. You didn't have anyone show you how to do yeah. it. Yes, and asking questions, and also it was before internet, which right. is hard. To of course, you know, there was no access to anything. You know, and you it, know. It, it, which which plans did you did you use at first, or did you figure out? No, a friend gave me a plan of um, of a French nineteenth century look back. Oh, nice, uh, nice. So I, I, I worked from that, and uh, I remember not really understanding what was <laughs> <what>. <laughs> So I made my first instrument, and then that sort of worked, but, and then a few more, just the same, to, to mm-hmm. get to understand. 
Mm-hmm. So you were, were you building um, other instruments also, like were you building other instruments as well as hurdy gurdies or did you just decide to go straight into building hurdy gurdies? Yes, so I had made quite a few guitars, uh, early guitars and, and lutes, and then I switched completely to hurdy gurdies. Yeah. Okay. What about um, what about musical? Do you play hurdy gurdy or other musical instruments? So I played I played classical guitar and piano when I started. And hurdy gurdy, I would say I obviously I I can set them up, tune them, uh, hear them very well. I'm not a very good player, okay. but I can. When you, you know, I'm, I'm guessing your approach to building, because, you know, I've, I've looked at your website and, and seen, you know, uh, some of your instruments. Uh, I'm guessing your approach to building is probably radically different than everyone else's since you, you started in that way, yeah? What do you mean? <laughs> um, I, well, I mean, my thought is if you if you just start building an instrument by learning how to do it yourself versus learning mm-hmm. it from someone who's been doing it for a while or learning it from a tradition, maybe the yeah. approach. Okay. Yes. I mean, I, I, at first I really copied this plan and I copied so pretty much traditional instruments. So that's what I did for the couple of first couple of years. Then I switched to make my own sort of little student instruments, more modern, but in a way quite similar in the build. Mm-hmm. At the traditional instrument, mm-hmm. which has, I believe it's how a lot of people learned. And then once I knew more, started to experiment more. But for a long time, I made fairly traditional builds until I really wanted to change it, but I had a lot of work and I was just doing what people asked me to do. And then I felt it's time to change. Right. So I stopped taking orders. That was about eight, nine years ago, stopped taking orders. Mm-hmm finish the other book and then developed new things again and tried try different builds really um, got a bit more yeah drastically different I suppose to what I did before right and, and nice. going, um, the back of your instruments you know they, they have this exoskeleton eh? nice you know, skeleton yes. on it right <laughs> yeah. um, can you tell us a little bit about that yeah, I can. Um, well, I mean, the thing is, 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 the exoskeleton is one thing. It's a visual thing. Obviously, the inside is really quite changed. So the, the overall sound is because, um, well, basically, the back has no frame uh, inside, no, 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 um, no, no bars, and, um, and could vibrate quite independently. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so the frame avoids the player to dampen the instrument, having the, the instrument against their belly create this distance and and that makes quite a change when you try from no frame to the frame it sort of opens the sound quite quite a bit right seems to to free to free the back um and some players what some players have said is that it makes the sound travel differently so the player hears it slightly differently than they would otherwise um mm. but that works only with with the internal changes as well so mm-hmm. right. And the internal and changes. The positive, which wasn't made for that on, uh, at first, but on the other positive was afterwards thinking, well, actually, it also protects the back. You could, you know, put the instrument somewhere, or it gives a, a protection as well. Uh, right. That did bonus. Mm-hmm. It, it wasn't and, made for that. And so what I'm what I'm envisioning is, so you have this this back, which is the exoskeleton, and then if I were to mm-hmm. to look in one of the holes to see the, the bottom or the back. Uh, mm. There, there would not be any no braces, no ribs. It'd just be a flat, flat piece of wood or curved or however. Yes, it I mean it's, it's quite curved, um, and I use um, I use some post plate on it, quite a thin plate inside post plate, mm-hmm. which gives some protections, but the sound travels. Um, um, and um, and yes, and then it has one sound post onto the sound post plate. Right. I mean, um, I, I've seen I've seen an idea like that when I, when I played mandolin, they would put like a cage on, on yes. the back of it. The idea oh, really? comes from that. Yes, oh, really? Not, I never seen that. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's not new, actually. I mean, it's it's um, I believe from the fifties, sixties. It's an American thing, isn't it? You could yeah. order you clip on uh, metal frames um, that you clip on mandolins. Um, that's where the idea came from. Um, yeah. 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 They call mm. it a. I think they call it a tone guard or, or, or yeah. something like that. Tone guard, okay. It's tone guard, yeah, yes, it is. That. It's a fancy name. <laughs> it, it is a fancy name, and she's right. Uh, it's just like a cage that you like clip uh, on, and it keeps yeah. it from 
pressing up against your body. The nice thing about the tone guard, and in a way, I'd like to go more like that in some way that it can be clipped on and off. I mean, my frame oh. can put on and off, so you could take it off as well, but something a bit lighter um, is, is a nice thing. Um, having said that, the nice thing of my frame is that you still feel the vibration on your tummy. So it doesn't, ah, yeah. the, 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 you know, the vibration travels through the frame right. as well. What, what, what is it made uh, of uh, the, the the frame, the skeleton? Is it wood I, or, or some yeah. sort of composite or? No, no, it's laminated wood. So I laminate ah. ply. I, I laminate ply and uh, what do I use now? I think some ash veneer or maple veneer. Mm -hmm. Laminated on a, on a curve, so it's quite thin and strong. Um, so other than the exoskeleton, I'm curious. Um, can you? Would you be able to tell us about the models that you do offer? You know, based on the infamous premier pas. <laughs> yeah. Infamous, thank you. Yes. <laughs> uh, so premier pas is my little uh, starter model, I suppose. Um, even so, I think it's a fully working instrument in its, right, in its own right, really. But uh, so I do this. So it's just very small, really quite small little instrument, compact. Um, so I do not offer much um, much um, uh, possibilities on it, on options. So I do the premier pas and premier pas plus. The premier pas is five string, five strings, mm -hmm. and the premier pas plus is with seven strings, two trumpet, two drums, and two melodies. So a little soprano, easy to travel with, um, but nonetheless quite warm and quite quite loud. Um, um, then I do another soprano, a bit more upscale, um, and with more pos potential options. So that's my dolly. Yep. Then I do an alto, so that's 360 mil uh, string lengths. Mm -hmm. um, not what to say there, you could have more strings, so three strings, quite commonly, three drums, three trumpets if you want. Um, I don't really do any more than three trumpets anymore. I'm not sure. One needs more, but that's, that's choices. Who needs more? <laughs> Who needs more? Well, I've got four, but I'm not sure. Four is, I think, uh, three. No? Do, do you, you say you have done four or you've seen four? I have done, I've done four. And I thought actually maybe. Hmm. I've seen I've seen up, up to six. And it's like, six. why? Why? <laughs> How does that even that, fit? Yeah, I mean, I've done four and I thought, well, actually, no. I, yeah. So anyways, that's my alto. And then I do a tenor, which is 500 mil scale lens. So that gives you two octave and a uh, fifth. Wow. So yeah, that's, um, that's what I um, offer, really. So your range, your range of scale lengths go from what, like 346 millimeters up to five? Yeah, 500. 500? Yeah. Okay. What was, what's the scale length of your soprano? Uh, 335? Yeah. Okay. 335? Mm -hmm. No, no, no. 345. 345. Ah, 345. 345. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Right, right. yeah. Nice, nice. And uh, you, if I recall correctly, you recently did uh, a hardy for Brian, who we just previously had on the, the podcast. And you, did you do more uh, with the electronics on that one? Oh, very interesting. Okay, so that was the normal, well, the um, normal um, amplification I do and then Brian asked me to add a little um, system and I forgot the name of it actually <laughs> so um, <laughs> that's okay <laughs> if you remember tell that. me and I'll put it in here <laughs> yes um, let's oh. change Tonewood no not the Tonewood hub I, I did feel it's, it's similar right. similar to the Tonewood you put a Tonewood in there but that's not a ton of wood. It, it has a similar thing that uh, you, you fit it in and then it has um, amplification system working with a battery and um, no exterior amp. Um, right. But I forgot the name of the system. But that worked really quite well. Um, okay. That's, that's good nice to know because... when I to, to travel with on... Yeah, when I first when I first got into the Hurdy Gurdy and I had my my Alter Wind, uh, what I wanted to do, I, I I knew about the Tone Woods because of guitar, and I thought mm -hmm. if I could get that in there, so I actually ah. ordered one, and I, I found a way to like get it in the Hurdy Gurdy, and it didn't work really well. <laughs> so, so you're saying with maybe a, a better Hurdy Gurdy and a better system, it actually works pretty well. 
Well, I mean, the tunnel would help by fitted on Brian Steno worked really well. Okay. It works really well. Um, and I have fitted one on another instrument for a French player. And I think few other people want it. And I, I was really quite happy with it. Yes. Um, does, it, does it increase the volume any, or is it just more like the reverb effect and those kinds of things? Well, it, in, it, it increases the volume as well. I mean, it's like um, uh, an amplification system without an external cable and amp. Right. So you have a little mm -hmm. inbuilt thing, um, which is quite funny, you know, when we tried it on festivals, sort of unexpected, just switch it on and here it is, and then it has <laughs> effect. Yeah. And then it has effects. The only thing is that it consumes a lot of batteries. So, oh, um, I didn't know this. Okay. And yeah. what, what, so what does it offer? Like a reverb, delay, chorus, what else? Yeah, yeah that's that. That's that. Ah, that's just that. that eh? uh -huh. yeah. But it's, it's fun. It's, it's fun. Um, the price for the, for the unit itself is not enormous. And I find it's, yeah, it's worth it. Obviously, it will work differently on, on different instruments. Um, so turn with a hump on my back because the back is really mobile and there's a mm -hmm. lot of space. It's great, and we tried where where it worked best. Um, ah, of course. A bit more limited with some some other instrument might have different well yeah. different sound, but um, yeah, I'd, I'd recommend it. Uh, it's I a great idea. Yeah, that's. Um... Um, but you have to, so with the tone woods, or I'm just thinking, I'm just kind of stuck on that for a minute because I'm familiar mm. with it. With those, you have to have access to the inside of the gurdy, right? Doesn't it? Oh, uh, yes. Like, like, and the frame, with, it works with, um, with a, a, a cross frame, metal cross frame, and uh, it's not metal, actually, it's plastic, but, but it's magnetic, magnetic, right? And magnetic. Correct. And mm -hmm. Pick the magnets there, and though actually you could have different system for different instruments and use the box, the same box for instruments. Uh, the, the magnetic frame stays stays inside. Right. Um, yes, you need. I mean, I've, uh, what I did is that I I, I had a, a side opening onto the ribs to to insert it in. You need quite quite a big thing, quite mm -hmm. a big opening to insert it in. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, the wheel slot wouldn't wouldn't work. Um, mm. so you need. Well, you with your with your hurdy gurdies, I'm, I'm sorry, Sergio. Go ahead. Did you? No, no, no. I was I was thinking. So it's I never I never had a tone with myself. But I was thinking then uh, it's not something that uh, a player could fit uh, himself on on an instrument. It, it requires like luthier work. If if there was a hole on your if there was an access panel, you could do it. Mm, right? Okay. Yeah, and 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 then the tone would help works on. You need to have an amplification system inside because then you plug it into your. To your ah, so pickup. it also requires a pickup. Ah, okay, yeah. okay. You 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 plug it into your existing pickup, and it picks up vibrations from from your pickup. Mm. Uh, so it needs that. Um, I've had some people asking me actually, um, and they thought they had they had some opening in the back of their instruments, and they, mm. they thought if it's big enough, then they they would try to fit it in. Okay. So in a way, if you already have some form of trap um you could fit it yourself um, okay yeah i definitely do it on a good hurdy-gurdy like i said i, I tried on my alter <laughs> wind and the, the hole was big enough i could get it in there but i, I sent it back because i thought this this doesn't work well, uh, my, my other question was about this because it's a neat idea um uh when you when you engage the the drones and everything Again, I've not put it on a good a good instrument, but doesn't that overpower it? Or when when you've got everything on, I was just kind of wondering how the reverb, how the chorus, how the delay actually worked in that regard. Uh, to be honest, it's I haven't had one for a while. I I, I mean, you know. Um, um, oh, I'm sorry. Brian, it's, it's interesting. No, no, Brian would probably be the best for it. I've, I've played with it. Uh -huh. Played with the next one. No, it wasn't a problem. Okay. Um, I don't remember it being a problem. Um, hmm. It's very. Well, it, 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 to, to work on the balancing a bit on the on the on the system to to work it out, but I don't remember it be, being a big problem, really. No. Of course, but if if I I'm not familiar with the tone boot itself, but mm. then uh, if you have to 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 feed it with a with a, a, a pickup. Yeah. Then the, yeah. the, the balance is not a problem because you can only, for example, well, you, you can you can feed it only with the chant yeah. and, and go on. Well, exactly. I mean, and, and, and you balance up with the rest. So if there was a problem, we would have adjusted it. I don't remember it being a problem. Right. 
Right. Nice. Yeah, I I would, I've been really, really quite good fun. So yeah. <laughs> try out. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, I didn't mean to, to take us on a little side route about no, 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 no. woods. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's something that 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 Claire had for for a while. So yes, I think it was interesting. <laughs> but, Problem. But I, I was I was curious about your 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 electronic system in general. I mean, are are you using um, what are you using for for your electronic system? Are you able to have like separate channels and these sorts of things, or is it just a you just plug it in and, and go? No, it's different channels. So, uh, well, people can have whatever they want. I've made up to four channels. So one for melodies, one for drones, and one for trumpets, and one for um, sympathetics. And is the bleed... There are two sympathetics, if, if there's mm -hmm. two sympathetics going into one. Gotcha. Uh, yeah. So these are like piezo? No, it's uh, this little microphone, so the charm for them. Oh, okay. okay. Mm -hmm. Memory plays that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Mm -mm. Cool. Well, and I got my electronic system developed with uh, a friend, Alex, who used to make uh, Hardy Girl, is um, unstopped many years ago, and we developed together this, this um, uh -huh. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got one more question before we um, listen to the second track that you uh, provided for us. And really, what I'm kind of curious uh, about is. Are there any are there any uh, hurdy gurdy builders that, that inspired your work or or yeah any hurdy gurdy luthiers or builders that oh, really contributed? Of course, of course. Um, in some ways, many because when I started, I looked at everything. Um, of course. I suppose, yeah, and I suppose taste also and the way I listen to instruments have changed a lot. So. Obviously, when I started with Ludbacks, and I listened to them, compare, and try to see, well, hear the different sounds from different make makers, see what they did. Um, so, in many ways, a lot of them. Um, How about your top three? Yes, top three. Oh. <laughs> names, names, names. <laughs> <laughs> It's difficult. It depends in which way I would I would put Denise Yorah in there. Obviously, a lot of the more modern, younger makers. I mean, mm -hmm. you know, we all got to somebody like him. Um, when I started, I looked quite high on um, on people like Jean-Luc Bleton also, who did some very, very nice designs um, and very interesting new things. Um, well, Wolfgang would be one of them, of course. Um, Alex, a guy who, who um, this friend who developed, well, who did, does my amplification system, Alex Eidler, mm -hmm. doesn't mm -hmm. make any more, but I, I, I learned a lot from him. Um, but, you know. Um, yeah. Nice. Chris, 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 Eaton, Chris Eaton, of course. Of course, Chris. <laughs> well, that's, I mean, being here, I, I, I learned a lot. I've seen a lot of his instruments. Um, and I owe him a lot. I mean, he's always been, you know, he's sent me people. It's been, it's been great. Um, so, yeah. Um, yeah. But in a way, a lot of them, Philippe Mounier, I used to really like uh, a lot of what he did. Um, I think you pick it. Uh, on, did you on, take, on, were you able to look at different instruments and, and did you take ideas from, from, from different builders and incorporate them into your work at all? I think or we all do. Yeah. yeah, everybody does that. Yes, everybody does. Um, yes, of course. Um, look at ideas. I mean, a lot of things uh, you learn also that a lot of things you see on others, it's never one thing, so it might not work the same on yours. So, I suppose you get um, to learn an overall way of thinking your instrument. I don't know how to say that, yeah, I don't know if it makes sense, but you look at your as a overall thing. So if I pick an idea on, on one maker in itself, that's not what... Yes, um, we get it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so you learn that well, but of course, I mean, you know, I use uh, metal tangents, which come from Wolfgang, which many people have uh, copied after. Of course, right. that's, mm -hmm. that's that. Um, a lot of things from Sioa, a lot of, of shapes. Um, yeah, I mean, I always, I always also think of doing different. Always, always. Um, 
Right. In a it's way, always I, good to, to have the, the personal uh, taste eh, on, on, on the instruments, of course. This is... Yeah, and if somebody does something and does it well, there's no point to you doing the same. So mm -hmm. um, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get away from it, actually. And funnily, when I say shape, in a way, I, I, when I go to the drawing board, I don't think of other people, but somehow because of the acoustic... The, um, well, the limits or what you have to do with, with mm -hmm. a herdic you can easily fall into the same ideas. And it right. also happens that you have ideas and you realize, ah, you didn't know, but somebody is doing the same. That also happens quite a bit. Yeah. Um, uh, the, the, wheel, the wheel works all the time, you know. <laughs> yeah. Well, fine. So it's, it's also that, oh, no, it's actually that came from me. But of course, it's a good idea. Somebody has it as I did too. So, yeah. Excellent. Um, well, let's take a moment to listen to the second track um, that you uh, showed or sent to me, and I will do my best to pronounce this. This is by uh, F. Paris, Frederic Paris, and Gil Chabanat. And is this Ouvre la Porte? Oh, I love it. <laughs> yeah, I love that piece. That piece is fantastic. I've been learning it uh, the last the last weeks. It's a fantastic. The old piece. Well, the whole album, I think, is fantastic. Yeah, 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 that's what I was going to say. The whole album, I could sit and listen to. <laughs> yeah. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Excellent. Well, let's have a listen. Open the door. Here we go. <laughs> is that what that means, open the door? Yeah, yes. Okay. <laughs> okay. I was trying to think of the Spanish version, but... Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Abre la puerta with right, Germán. Let's open the door and see how it goes. All right, here we go. <laughs> Thank you. 
Yeah. What a fantastic piece, eh, uh, Ryan and, and Claire. It's it's great. Mm. So what about well, as we were talking about this, this whole album? Personally, I love. But what made you choose uh, this track in particular, Claire? Well, in a way, when you told me to choose some tunes, I mean, it, it's three 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 tunes is such a choice. But I thought of this album straight away because it still is one of my favorite, actually. Um, uh, album, um, I suppose it because it was it, it. I think it dates from 95, 96, which was when I discovered the instrument and um, something very subtle about the overall thing. I mean that piece especially. Um, the the Ardigard is used a lot, if I remember, at the beginning of the piece, a lot as an accompaniment and used with with chords in a very subtle way, which I think it's that as well. The Ardigard can be that in in, in the background, but cleverly arranged and then it, oh, it intertwines with the clarinet and it's very subtle and it's 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 beautiful um yeah, yeah. the clarinet the clarinet and the hurdy-gurdy go really well mm. together yeah. as well yeah. as the saxophone and the hurdy-gurdy mm. i never would have thought that but those, those saxo mm, i don't know maybe don't so? i i don't know but with the clarinet i totally agree and also the <laughs> bass clarinet bass clarinet mm. Mwah. Mm. Mwah. The the albums by Herman with with also with the trumpet and, and oh it's oh. beautiful. I have a thing with the saxophones, Ryan. I I think <laughs> I I hate them a little little. Bit. <laughs> I don't particularly like them because I was forced to play them in, in eighth grade in the band. And oh so, really? Yeah. So I I don't they're not my thing. But when I've heard, I think Yo Johannes. I think didn't he do a track or two with a saxophone player? Oh, you are right. And it sounded okay. Mm. Yeah, I, I yeah, remember yeah, hearing yeah, it. You're and, right. That actually, that actually sounds really good. So yes. But anyway, um, so quick question for you, you Claire. Do all the hurdy gurdy makers in the UK hang out? Uh, <laughs> <What's that>? Oh, <laughs> did you say um, no? We are not many. How um, many uh, yeah, are how there? Many are like there? three? <laughs> we, 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 we have two left, two workshops left. So it's Chris and Sarah in Wales and me, and that's all now, I think, as far as I know. Um, Neil is sort of retired uh, from what I've heard. Um, there was my Gilpin. We used to, tr to, to, to be at college with Neil, to be a good friend, who has stopped many years ago because he had a bad stroke, sadly, mm -hmm. so can't, can't work anymore. So we're, we're not many. Um, as for hanging out, I mean, I'd love to see uh, Chris and, and um, Sabina a bit more, but we are just busy and far away. So we we meet once a year in France. <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah, not not because we don't like each other at all. I mean, we have news from each other through the year a bit, but it's just meant to be, um, I suppose, um, working away in the workshop and not not taking the time to meet <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah and and what um uh you know i'm, I'm assuming you you like your work so i'm, I'm kind of curious what is the best part of being a hurdy-gurdy luthier oh the best part yeah ah uh, i suppose when you hear your instrument really nicely played and uh, that's that has to be the best part mm -hmm. I suppose. Mm -hmm. when you you can forget all of the boring parts as well <laughs> and, just, <laughs> just it. Um, and having people having pleasure with it it's um it has to be the best part really. yeah um, are there boring parts to doing it oh you can yeah. tell so what did you say Sergio? no yes yes i i i sometimes <laughs> do restore uh, some instruments <laughs> i i am learning also the craft uh, huh? Of course, uh, on an amateur uh, way, yeah, yeah. there are some very repetitive tasks like the, yes, making uh, the I mean, wooden tangents and uh, uh, yeah. shaving the, 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 the legs of the tangents is a bit like... Uh. <laughs> yeah, I mean, in a, in a way, you, you, you know, yes, they are very repetitive tasks and sometimes it's nice also to have balance between things where you need a lot of concentration and thinking. And then when there's repetition, that's where I have this really great, uh, you know, podcast, radio, radio programs. And, um, and that's a positive. I really learn a lot. Like our podcast. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> like our podcast. <laughs> um, because, because, yes, when you have to do very repetitive things for, for a few days. Um, but, but you learn. You learn to deal with it. It's, I don't mind. I don't mind right. it. Well, Sergio brought up a, a good point, and I'm kind of curious what your, what your thoughts are on this. Um, you know, a, a while back, I thought it'd be a wonderful idea to learn how to build a hurdy-gurdy. 
And then mm-hmm. the more and more I thought about it, the more and more I experimented, the more and more I thought, why don't I just leave that to the people who already <laughs> build hurdy gurdies? So, so Sergio, since he's uh, learning the craft, as he said, I'm kind of curious. Um, do you have any advice for people who want to learn to build hurdy gurdies or, or who are beginning to 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 build them themselves based on your experience? Um, wanting to learn it to become fully professional or as a sort of fun thing on the side? Okay, well, let's say... We can do both. Maybe. Yeah, let's do both. So, so let's oh. say if it's just a fun thing on the side, what would you recommend? Uh, well, there's a few books out there. So, <laughs> um, well, yeah, talk to makers. Um, talk to makers. Um, no, with internet, I think there's a lot more help available. There's a few books. I'm just thinking a French book. You might have seen it, and I forgot uh, the name. Michael Pignol, uh, yes. Michael Pignol, yes. Was that the one you just held uh, up, Sergio? No, no. Sorry? No, no, I, I, was, I was also showing this one by uh, Helmut. Helmut yeah. it's Helmut. in. It's fun because I bought this book in German and I don't yeah. speak German, but... <laughs> Doesn't matter. It's good. It's good anyway. I go with Google, like, what is this? And it works. I I don't know if it's been ever translated. I'm not sure. No, no, no. I don't think so. No, no, no. Google Translate is is quite good. Totally, totally. Michel Pignol's book. um, So, in a way, there's quite a bit to to start with. uh, um, as for recommendations apart from that, um, there's a school in France in La Chatte, which does um gurdy building, uh, oh. making. Um, it's a one-year course or two, two-year course, and students have the possibilities they have to, to, to do different instruments. Mm-hmm. And I was not sure what to think about it at first, and I suppose as an introduction to try out different things. So you learn backpipe making, you learn guitar, you learn gurdy, you learn violin as a... As a little introduction, it could be quite good and then move on to a different school or... Right. Um, but and yeah. A hurdy-gurdy is the same thing as a mechanical bagpipe, right? <laughs> for for taxes in the U.S., yes. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Well, what were, you know, when, when you when you first started learning uh, to, to, to build the hurdy-gurdy or to build hurdy-gurdies, um, was there anything in particular that was really difficult that, that, that took some some working out that, that, you know, people might need to be aware of? <laughs> Everything. <laughs> I mean, the woodwork wasn't. Yeah. The woodwork wasn't, but I remember everything else. I had to learn everything. So when I made everything myself, um, and it was trying to yeah, trying to get in information I couldn't get. So I have to say I went to makers in Saint Chartier, but people were already quite <laughs> distant. Ah uh, yes. <laughs> so, but you know, people are busy. Now I understand as well that you know when you have a stall and it's busy all day, it's it's busy. Um so, um, but in a way I made my first instrument, I would say just make it and quite quickly. And um, I was always quite a fast builder, actually. And um, so at the beginning, that came with a lot of imprecision, but speed. Um, I learned to to get more precision and less speed. <laughs> <laughs> right. But it was a good way of understanding the old instrument. And, and then, so, um, but you get, and, and now you get also spare parts you could, you could order in. So... There's places which which will sell axles, which will sell. Mm. It's whether you have the facilities to do it yourself or not. But there's there's, there's some some things available now. I, I suppose it's right. easier. Mm-hmm. Well, there's a way of getting started, making an instrument, thinking about it. In a way, I, I, I think even as a play as a player, just as an amateur thing, it, it would be quite a positive thing for people to make one, just mm-hmm. to understand it more and, yes. and learn to deal with the little mechanical issues you might have um, on your instrument is a fantastic thing to, to know. That's the nerdy gurdy, totally. Uh, okay. Yeah, nerdy gurdy, yeah. <laughs> uh-uh. Well, Sergio, since since we have a, a professional, high quality luthier with us right now, do you have any questions for her based on your I, building? I would ask uh, questions for two hours. But uh, one of one of my questions would be, what uh, do which do you think is the 
uh, one of the critical uh, points on on the, on the instruments to to have a, a body a, a full sound big sound big sound yes like like the thickness of the of the top or the thickness of, of the bracings or okay, it's never, it's never one thing, Sergio. So it's many factors. But, eh? but that's what I was saying earlier on. You learn quite quickly that it's never one thing. You know, when um, okay, that's slightly out. But um, when people came and said, "Oh, I want to put a frame on my on my on my instrument back," you know, the exoskeleton, it will make it. Well, uh, actually, yes, I, no, cool. it won't. It won't because. It's 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 everything. It's the wood. It's uh, thickness of the wood. Um, the braces. Um, the the overall build. Um, it, it's all of that together. Um, of course, it's it's the, the conjunction of, of, of everything. It's yeah. conjunction of all of that, mm -hmm. and um, and some of it can be can be said. Of course, um, you know I do this, I do that, and some of it is. Um, like the thickness will depend on the flexibility of a given wood as well. So that's 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 feeling. <laughs> that's experience. That, well, it's always a bit, but it's experience. You learn totally. I, I fully understand works. this. It's a lot of experimentation and and see yeah. what works in your actual build. Yeah, yeah. And for some reason, and I've heard that from from other makers as well, which I found also quite interesting, is when I made. Um, loot bags which are really different from now and they sounded very different they played very differently but there was a certain element of the sound which i still have which mm -hmm. is still the same and my husband who makes guitars mandolin says the same his instruments from the beginning there was a certain element of the song which was which was always there even so he's changed like everything probably in 25 years of making mm -hmm. um, so that there must be something I, I don't know what that is, um, you know, but something is there's an element which is still there. Um, so know, it must I, be I, I, I believe I'm, I'm not sure if it was on the podcast or if it was in a different setting, but um, I was having a talking with Francesco and mm. uh, he had mentioned that the sound and the tonality of the hurdy gurdy has changed over the years. Was that in our podcast? Uh, I think so. I think so. He was talking yeah. about the that mini uh, ice uh, era period. Right. Yes. The seventeen hundreds. Yeah. Hundreds. Yeah. Yes. But he was also talking about how uh, how our how we hear or what we want to hear is different. Like for example, a long time ago. Oh yes. Know, it's kind of like a higher pitched, louder, and now more got, nasal, and now we want body bonus, and cello like sounds. Mm -hmm. yes. I, I was curious if that's and and we we talked about this a little bit more, but is is that just because maybe um, our ears have changed, or is it just that back in the day it had to be loud and squawky to be heard over the dancers? and over fields. I mean, that's why bagpipes were so loud, wasn't it? Yeah. And, and now we've got amplification, so we can work yeah. more on that kind of deeper level. Does that make sense? Yeah, I mean, you could have low and loud as well. Low and loud, yeah. Uh, you could also, <laughs> um, cutting through, but I think it's also, yeah, fashion and, and a, a bit what you, I mean, interestingly, when I was looking at some tunes to to share for this, um, listening to some things I've listened a lot, I. I it's quite easy to, to see straight away. Twenty years ago, we were a lot more top on the top hand of the right. you know very top top heavy, um, right. which now I find some elements a bit difficult to listen to. But it's <laughs> wonderful. It's wonderful, <laughs> nicely played. But we got used to go quite a bit lower. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, one thing Francesco also said, which just came to my mm. mind, was the thing that also contributed to that was uh, different types of strings. Like you can't have like a mm a thick gut string to get that deep sound. But now that we have yep. these alloys and so on, that yep. also contributes to it. Completely. And I mean, in a way, I, I could, even sopranos I make now, or I made 20 years ago, different different instruments as well. But same pitch, there's a, a certain sound quality, which is which is lower, but it is on the same pitch, you know. Oh. Um, it, it has a different ring to them and a different um, warmth. Um, so ha yes. has, has the quality... Of it is, and I find it's also interesting to see in 20 years how um, slightly, slightly uh, um, different um, point to that. But um, 
uh, or people also have opened up speaking of strings or sound or I really like the fact that that players have really opened up to all the possibilities and people mm -hmm. used to come they used to come and say, oh, that, oh, oh you use that or they wanted what they knew well now people come and the, the approach is different oh, oh what what do you do what I do oh oh surprise and they give it a go and nice. they really want to to explore what you have to offer on offer mm -hmm. rather than um, yeah, rather than not being that open. So, and I find that really, really nice. So it's a big, big change and it's really nice. You could bring up other things and uh, people are receptive to it. Um, has, has the, you know, I, I'm new, I'm relatively new to the Hurdy Gurdy, but I've played guitar and mandolin most of my life. Has the string technology changed a lot since, you know, the last 20, 25 years or because there's always been violins and cellos, right? I mean, yes. Is, is the string um, technology actually changed or have people just been using more cello and violin strings and those kinds of things? I would imagine the strings technology has changed a bit. I don't know a lot about the history of it and when, when things have changed. I suppose it, it keeps changing a lot. You get mm. new types of strings all the time. Yes. But, but also people have started to explore more different strings as well on, on the other gurdy. So it, it's, I would imagine it's a mix of both really. I have one more question on, on my list. Uh, so Sergio, I want to defer to you. Do, you. do you have any other questions that you'd like to, to ask Claire before hmm. we, we finish you up? You know, I, I, yes, I, I want to talk about something because I, I get many emails uh, a week, like uh, from beginners and, and people that want to start, right? And uh, it, it, I, have, I have one that repeats every week, at least one or two persons. Uh, would send me an email saying, oh, I want to build a hurdy-gurdy in my garage <laughs> to, to start playing because, you know, uh, the price is so high and blah, 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 blah. And mm. uh, I think people don't realize how many machinery is actually needed to, mm. to, to make a, a, a playable instrument. Mm. So uh, can we talk about that a little bit? Uh, Yes. About the machinery, the the metal lathes, the wood lathes, the the big be, the the saws, the everything that 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 a person needs to to build a hardy gurdy. So you want Claire to give us a list? Yeah, maybe not a list, but uh, maybe to talk about this so people realizes how difficult it is to build a hardy gurdy in your garage with no equipment. <laughs> no, you need equipment. I suppose again, if you order in your metal bits if you order in your axle wheel insert and so on and your handle you don't need a metal lace maybe mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. but yes normally you will need a metal turning lace wood turning lace um some sole um pillar drill very useful mm -hmm. um bending iron um Imagine, yeah. <laughs> lots things of things. Not necessarily, but it's very useful, a very fast, strong sanding station. <laughs> I mean, yeah, sander sickness is great, but if you want to make a lot, <laughs> um, I, I don't know, a routers, um, Yes, of course, it requires. You need you need a full workshop to at least to be comfortable uh, and, yeah. and and to yes. do things yeah. you know <laughs> how they are supposed to be. So <laughs> yeah, but sometimes you'd be amazed. I mean, I'm amazed sometimes of discovering how little some people have and they get these amazing things out. So mm -hmm. it, it's possible, but and of course, is that plus uh, knowing woodworking because some of the people that uh, send me emails they don't know anything about woodworking no, and they don't any... have any any equipment. So I'm like, ah, how no. do you no. think you can make no. a hardy gardy in your garage? <laughs> no. No, then that's not possible. No, <laughs> no. So, so if we had someone not who's... very helpful though, but <laughs> totally, totally. If we had someone who made violins, they would be more likely to know <laughs> what needs to be but, done, right? <laughs> well, with violins, you actually need a lot less. I mean, you could oh, make okay. a violin yes. in on a on a on a kitchen table. Uh, I'm not saying it's nothing to a violin. It's not. Yeah. A <laughs> but you don't need a lot of equipment. Um, right. But you need uh, to know what you're doing, of course, knowledge, but that, a lot that, far less equipment, yes. I, I said I only had one more question, but you just, this brought up another one for me. Um, in the United States, there really aren't any 
there's no one that's nope. building decent mm. that I'm aware of mm-hmm. at the moment. Mm-hmm. I, I've mm-hmm. heard rumors that, that one is happening soon, mm-hmm. um, but there's definitely not any uh, builders that I can drive a couple hours to, to get my hurdy gurdies worked on. So I'm kind of curious, um, would a, would a guitar builder or would a, a violin builder, if something needed done to the hurdy gurdy that wasn't mechanical, so or, or so, would they be someone that, that could work on and address issues with the hurdy gurdy? Um, it's an issue. It depends what what needs to be done. I suppose a lot of people probably could. Um, I mean, I have questions. That obviously, I ship instruments all over. Um, and some decision in my making, there's some things I wanted to do. Um, which um, which which implied some possible movements and changes, but then I, I had to think differently because unlike a violin maker or you know a violin or a cello, you won't have somebody in the corner to fit back the sample plates when it falls, mm-hmm. right. which is not. Mm-hmm. Um, on a hardy gurdy, it's very easy to put back a sun post, but but you need to take the wheel off and so on and. Uh, you don't have a maker on the mm. corner. So mm-hmm. I, I think about it when I make changes to the instrument, of course. Um, I think some things, yes, probably, yeah, well, yes, definitely. Some guitar okay. makers could do. And possibly you could get get some information from your maker. Um, that's yeah, and trans- that's and clever. That's clever, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I had once an instrument I shipped to Spain, actually, and it got damaged, a little bit damaged in the, in the flight. And I have a good friend of mine, um, um, Gampa maker in Spain, and we exchanged, and that got sorted like that, no problem. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so those things can, can be done as well, of course. But the fact yeah. that there's a lot of makers around, of course, is... Mm-hmm. And that being said, uh, probably 70% of the problems would be adjustment problems. So contact a teacher or a professional player in your area, yeah. uh, first yeah. of all, I mean, because if you if you go to a guitar maker and say, okay, this, no. this doesn't sound no. right, the guitar guy no. would be like, what is this? Right. <laughs> so, they, might, they probably will make it work. work yeah, like probably, that. yes. Yeah, I, I'm, not, I'm not necessarily talking about like, you know. No, no. Uh, adjusting tangents or wheel or ax wishes no. I, I know that but i mean like if you know if you get a crack or if a seam opens yeah, that, that that's for sure that, that that's you need a good worker that's nothing yeah right. yeah that's not that's that could be sorted i mean any issues obviously with machine heads any issues with something sure. coming off yeah of course mm-hmm. of course Something not very specific to the hardy gurdy right yeah no problem good working okay yeah okay. no, no yeah yeah, well, yeah, my, yeah. My final question, um, my final question is probably a big one, but uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll see. Um, I'm just kind of curious. You've been building hurdy gurdies a while, and you've worked with um, you know, numerous clients. You've built mini gurdies for many people. What are some general, general maintenance tips and strategies that you recommend? Like, so let's say someone gets a hurdy gurdy from you. And a year goes by and they've been playing it and they've been having a good time and learning. Mm-hmm. A year goes by and maybe it needs some adjusting. What what general things do you recommend to help keep the gurdy sounding good, you know, mm-hmm. consistently? Well, the first thing I always tell people is that um, it's it's always good to bring it back for a little checkup. <laughs> okay. Well, let's pretend uh, you're in the United States and there's no I one. I know. <laughs> The United States people ignore it. And talking to colleagues, they, they say the same that, you know, and I think after the first year, it's always good as well because things might have changed a bit. Right. So, mm-hmm. being back after a year, just a little checkup. Um, um, otherwise, if you're in the United States, uh, well, apart from the usual um, things to do with a hurdy gurdy to keep it. Um, Maybe they. Well, um, I mean, um, I mean, is it mainly like tangents going out of tune, or or things like that, or? Um, well, obviously, tuning your tangents, it's a good idea to learn. You need to learn. Yeah. You need to learn. You need to learn <laughs> again. A complete beginner coming and getting an instrument. I I explain everything. Takes the time. If, if they can come here, I explain. And often it's too much. So I think, okay, that <laughs> when when you come back for your revision, yeah, I'll, I'll take you through completely how to tune or, you know, I'm happy to do a, 
to do it in in um, Zoom calls, um, explaining how mm -hmm. I do, um, and the tricks I, I have to to tune to tune and tune faster as well. Um, learning to tune well and at a certain speed, um, and uh, I suppose dusting your instruments. Um, I mean, it's it's. Is there, is, mine is full of dust. <laughs> yeah. Is there yeah. anything that's not obvious? You know, like for example, changing the strings. You know, adjusting the bridge, m m doing yeah. the mm, yeah. Maybe maybe the humidity levels, because in the U.S. Yeah. you have a lot of problems with that, because there are certain oh. places uh, where you go like minus oh. twenty degrees and ten okay. percent humidity, and that means crack. Yeah. So maybe you have some recommendations to, to no, those of people. No, of course, that... keep, keep, um, keep um, trying to keep a, a certain level of humidity. I would say anything between uh, uh, 45 and... Uh, 45? That's a lot. <laughs> <Ryan> is checking. <laughs> checking right now. <laughs> no, but to go, to go up anything between 45 and... I got 41. Yeah. Well, well. Um, well, it's. I think it still is okay. I mean, yeah. it depends where where your instruments be built as well, and what was the recommendation from the builder. But right. between forty five and sixty, you're, yeah, you're it's a safe safe place. It, it, but of course, okay. if you but see your your humidity uh, going uh, below twenty, oh 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 yeah. oh oh. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Do something yeah, yeah. fast. <laughs> do something, do something. Um, I mean, I like keeping my instrument always in a case, uh, covered, av avoiding dust. Um, but, you know, I've had people leaving their instrument in their kitchen all the time, and there's a cooking <laughs> coming on the wheel. Not a good idea. Um, all, the, all the grease <laughs> in the wheel. Yeah, the all the grease everywhere, <laughs> kitchen grease. It's not good. <laughs> Well, you, you mentioned where it's built is important. I, I think that's a, I'm curious about that because uh, before we started this, we were talking a little bit about humidity and like, for example, my guitar and my mandolin, which I've had for, you know, over a couple decades now, they were built in uh, Oregon, which it's really dry there. Mm -hmm. I've never had any issues. I've never hard, I've never humidified them. I, I've just, mm -hmm. they've just yeah. done what they've done. And then, um, you know, Neil Brook, when, when we were talking about humidity, he was saying that in the UK, that the humidity rarely ever drops below, or at least where he is, rarely ever drops below 50%. So that could be a problem if, if, if a hurdy-gurdy ship from somewhere where the humidity is usually high to a place where it's usually low. So that's mm -hmm. something to consider, right? Yeah, I mean, that would crack, is a risk of cracking, yeah, yeah, if it goes below. Um, I prefer building a little bit drier. Um, right. I mean, we have, we have quite a dry thing here, and obviously we, we, we also humidify or dehumidify the workshop. So um, it's rather a bit drier where we are. Um, I don't, I'm, I'm quite happy uh, building around 45, 50, uh, rather a bit drier. And then if it gets to a wetter place, it could rise a bit, but it won't crack. It would rise a bit, then you, you adjust right. the, the string height with adjustments. Mm -hmm. So I'd rather that than the other way around. Um, right. But uh, yes, obviously, if you are in a, in a place in the States with those big changes, that's very important to, to keep mm -hmm. an eye. The humidify or dehumidify, depending on, on, on where you are. Um, and talk to the maker who's, right. who's good. And, um, yeah, I, I, I forget who I was talking to, but it was someone um, who was it? Anyway, they had numerous nice hurdy-gurdies and, and they said, yeah, every hurdy-gurdy that I get from the UK always ends up with cracks in it. <laughs> and I think it's probably because the, 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 they're, they're not, the humidity is dropping. <laughs> so. No, but that shouldn't be because obviously, um, just yeah. put a humidifier <laughs> there. And, well, anyway. really, you dehumidify, you yeah, dehumidify. Yeah. And as I told you, yeah. <laughs> uh, Ryan, before, for some reason where we live in the little tip of, of um, of uh, Kent, uh, county of Kent, um, in Britain, we have um, apparently the same level of precipitation as in Madrid. Oh. So oh. right. we, we, we tend to have dry, especially now in February time, it's, it tends to be a few weeks of really quite dry. Mm -hmm. So at times I've used a humidifier actually, rather than a dehumidifier. Right. Um, but as I said, rather, rather built a little drier than yeah. a little too wet. So, but, mm. Excellent. 
Well, I want to thank you both for being here today. It was really wonderful to meet you, Claire, and great to have you on the podcast. So thank you for being here. Are we not listening to the third tune? We are, but we we go out on that tune. (laughs) (laughs) So so anyway, (laughs) well then, that brings us to a point. Um, So Sergio, thank you for being here too. Yes, fantastic. (laughs) And the tune we're going to listen to is by Herman Diaz and Pascal, how do you say his last name? Lefer. Yeah, Lefebvre. Lefebvre. Pascal Lefebvre. Longa Farhafsva. Did I pronounce that correctly? Mm-hmm. Okay. As well, the French is improving a lot, Ryan. Yes. Well, as I, as I told Claire, you know, I, since I want to go to the, the festival in France, I'm learning French now, and I can say cat and boy in French. So uh, I'm on so, the way. Okay, nice. <laughs> it, 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 you have to think of a few other names, but a few other things, but... You need uh, <laughs> yeah, Ryan. Uh, you need I, to I learn how to say lingo. potato. What's that? Potato. You need to. You need to learn how to say potato. This is uh, one of the best French words for me. How do you it's say cargo. it? Cargo is an important one as well. Oh, cargo as as well. It's nail. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> well, all right, I'll work on it. But in the meantime, in the meantime uh, what made you pick this track, um, Claire? Well, I, I wanted to have something with Pascal Lefebvre on, him, on it because it's a player who's been very influential to me um, when I started. Um, and um, I don't know if you're familiar to, with this player, uh-huh. but he's, he's had a lot of um, interesting projects, uh, which mm-hmm. are dating a bit now, but Vialistic Orchestra, which was an orchestra of nine or ten Hardy players from France. Oh, wow. All the best. Um, Players at the time, yes. Um, I think Herman actually was was part yes, of the orchestra to end. Um, and and as they played anything from medieval music, baroque, contemporary, Bella Bartok, traditional, and Pascal always brought in um, was taking a bit of distance from the traditional players at the time. He was playing rumbas and tangos and. Um, Middle Eastern tunes. I, I yeah, I wanted to, to to choose something from him, and then that Swiss German was really fantastic too. So that's yeah, mm-hmm. excellent. Well, I think but, uh, w- w- one, one second. One thing. I think uh, Pascal is starting a, a YouTube channel where he's mm-hmm. putting uh, all of his music. I think he has like forty albums. It's it's crazy. It's, he just posted yeah. that today, right? Or yesterday. I, I think so. So if you guys want to keep an eye, uh, Pascal Lefer on, 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 on YouTube and have a look at, at his music because it's really fantastic. Mm-hmm. Mm, he's a great player. Yeah, yes. Yeah. Excellent. Well, again, thank you both for being here. And we're going to have a listen to this track and that'll take us out for today. So thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, it's great fantastic. seeing you. <laughs>